the community of people who talked about climate change used to be climate modelers and two or three or four eccentric people from other disciplines. Um, what's happening now, and I think the network is a really good example of that, is that the study of climate change and climate change related impacts is actually becoming a respectable academic field in which people are writing PhDs, they're projecting a career for themselves, it's coming from different disciplines and different fields. So there's just a kind of, um, if you wanted to put this in um, kind of managerial terms, there's a kind of human capital infusion to the climate change discussion, which is awesome and humbling and really, really wonderful to see. So that's the first thing I think that's that's different. The second thing is the breadth of the issues, that a lot of us who worked on climate change um, kind of in the early days were all about what is called in the field mitigation, which means emissions reduction, as you know. And there was this feeling that that was the game. The game is to get serious emissions reduction. That's the fundamental question, really, about climate change. Well, 30 years later, we haven't gotten serious emissions reduction, and so there's all of these other questions about how we're going to live with climate change, how we're going to adapt to it, whether we're going to offer compensation to those who've been harmed, whether we're going to try to do something like try to get our hands on the climate switch to try to set the temperature down, to turn it down, whether we're going to try to get the carbon out of the atmosphere. So there's a whole range of really uh, both profoundly important and also intellectually challenging questions that didn't really exist in the early days of the discussion. I don't tend to think of myself as a particularly stubborn person, and I don't like to think of myself as somebody who doesn't really change their minds about things. But I really think that things that I was writing in the 80s that were expressing fears are now things that I'm reporting as facts, as done deals. So, for example, um, one of my early papers, um, I basically said the great danger of climate change is that this is a problem where humanity may remake the planet, yet no one will be responsible. And it seems to me that that's exactly what's happened. And I also, in those days, talked about if that happens, we're going to really need to think about um, what kind of people we need to be in a new climate change world, which will be a very different world and will call for different conceptions of courage and temperance and, uh, and, and other virtues. And so all of that was kind of in my early work in a compressed, tentative way. And, and now I think it's just the world that we find ourselves in. And there is something both very sad about this and yet oddly gratifying to the ego, I hate to admit. I think the reason that climate change is part of why it's such a profoundly difficult question is, is because it's not an issue that can be easily assimilated to any of our old comfortable paradigms. So there was a lot of the green movement and the environmental movement that really um, did incorporate um, some of the old um, kind of left-right thinking and and you know there's this there's this idea of the watermelon you know you scratch a green and they're really a red and there there really was something to that idea and so in some some parts of the environmental movement you did get uh, people who were more or less giving the same sort of critiques um, that they used to give sort of in another context that we're now doing in an environmental context. But I really do think the climate change issue is a really different issue. I think it's really not, um, I think it's distorted if it's simply cast as a sort of us against them, um, the power structure against the people sort of issue. Because what's really required to live in the Anthropocene is really a, a, an entire change of state on the part of the plan and the part of how we live on the planet, uh, both individually and collectively. And there's something about that phase change that requires a kind of cooperation, a kind of collective movement, in a way that the sort of old struggles about power and were much more in some ways about winning and losing and about zero sum. I don't mean that there aren't bad people, 
but mostly where it's not bad people who are changing the climate. It's, it's, it's me who's changing the climate. I don't happen to think I'm a particularly bad person, maybe not a particularly good person, not a particularly bad person, but it's people who are driving to pick up their kids from football practice. It's, uh, it's people digging coal who are just simply trying to have a good life in areas where there aren't a lot of other jobs. It's really people getting by within the constraints of how they feel um, with, the, with what life has given them. So the story that a lot of us had, I think, at the time was that the world had been crippled because of the East-West division coming, coming out of World War II. And there was a sense in which the really major problems of being human and living on the planet were being ignored, were being suppressed, because we were all living under the shadow of both conquest and nuclear holocaust from one side or the other. As we got into the 1980s and we began to see the kind of loosening up of the Soviet system, we began to see actually the fact that the, that the, the communist system as it had been practiced simply could not really compete in global markets with the Western systems and so on and so forth. That division began to crack up. And in particular, there was a, an amazing speech uh, in 1991 that Gorbachev gave to the United Nations, which is one of the most visionary speeches uh, I think that any political leader has ever given. And it really is about we can drop the old conflicts of the Cold War, and it's now time for the East and West to join together and to, and to, and to deal with the twin evils of global environmental degradation and underdevelopment. And it wasn't just Gorbachev, he just happened to put it, I think, very articulately, but this was a feeling that was going around. And that's really the energy that fed the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And I think a lot of the discussion was very strange when we went into Kyoto and when we went into the first part of this, of this millennium because a lot of policy analysts would look at the Kyoto Protocol and so on and say, what a stupid idea. Here, you, you know, you're taking part of the world and you're saying they have to reduce emissions. Everyone else gets a free ride. What, what kind of a deal is that? And in a way, it missed the whole point that there was a guiding vision, a guiding cooperative vision where the relationships were going to change through time, the obligations were going to change through time. But what, but, but what was supposed to solidify it was the good faith and the desire to solve these problems on the part of all the people in the world. And it's that dream that died, and it's a dream that died to a, for many reasons, but mostly because um, the, the countries that had been the biggest emitters, let particularly the United States, simply did not keep its part of the bargain. It sort of was dragged along on this dream, but as a nation, the United States never really accepted it. Uh, once you start getting defection from that kind of story, then you begin to get a lot of defection along the margins, and then you enter a period of forgetfulness. People forget how the system was supposed to work. And so when they look back where they say, you know, weren't those people silly? Weren't they naive? What were they thinking? I think what we saw today was a wonderful collegial bringing together of diverse people who would not ordinarily sit in a room together, who were paying attention to each other and were listening to each other. I also think that what you're doing here, which is exactly right, is that this kind of, of problem-solving interdisciplinarity has to be built from the bottom up. In fact, in fact, changing an institution like a university or a research system is not unlike changing a society. Um, when we reflect back on the civil rights movement, for example, in the United States in the 1960s, the story that I tell is, you know, we, we tend to get hung up and people will say things like, yeah, it's true that we passed these laws that integrated society, but that didn't overcome everybody's racism. Well, yes, that's, that's right, but, what you, but it brought about profound social change, and what you need to do that social change is you need an activist, minority, the grassroots level. You need, a, um, you need leadership at the top. And what you need from everyone else is permission, is you need people who are willing to say, well, we don't know whether we're really into this racial integration thing, but we don't, well, we're not going to stop it. We don't, we, you know, we're not going to devote ourselves to resisting that change. Something like that is very much true in universities. 
What you need is this activist minority that you're building in this network to create these relationships. You need, you need leadership from the top of the university who's giving you money to do it. And then the hardest thing is you need the permissive majority. You need those people in the faculties, in the departments, and so on and so forth to actually say, you know what, it's okay if people who have responsibilities in our department are doing that kind of research and we're going to reward that work and we're going to look favorably upon it. So I actually see, um, I see universities as part of the problem in, uh, in dealing with these issues and I think it's probably the part of the problem that we should generally be devoting more of our attention to because that is the world in which academics live and I see the process of social change in universities to not really be substantially different from the process of social change in the broader society.